Well, we've been looking at the story of the book of Ruth, a story which we realize is not just a story, but it is in fact a message from God to us. And in this we've seen that perhaps the key message that God gives in this wonderful story is that in life God orders absolutely everything to fit and to serve his purposes all of the time. Now that's a very simple description, but it points us to something that theologians refer to as the providence of God. The providence of God is not just that God provides, that's a mistaken way of looking at it, but it is that God who is sovereign works out his purposes perfectly in everything that happens in the lives of his people. Now I mentioned to you last time when we looked at this two weeks ago that the writers of the Belgic Confession of Faith when they spoke of the providence of God spoke about it being unspeakable comfort to God's people. And so it is the providence of God. Whether it is a storm of life or it is a day of sunshine in life. Nothing in life is down to random chance or blind fate. Instead, the Bible tells us, and the whole story of the Ruth points to, there is clear reason and intention within everything. And the intention is the intention of a heavenly Father. The Belgic Confession also spoke of nothing can happen to us by chance. What a comfort that is to the believer. That whatever is going on in your life right now, whatever may go on, nothing ever happens to us by chance. But it goes on to write, but only by the arrangement of our gracious Heavenly Father who watches over us with fatherly care. But of course the reality is, as this story shows us, that the twists and turns of God's providence in our lives often appear utterly mysterious to us. In times of great pain, loss, disappointment, frustration, we find ourselves wondering, what in the world is God doing here? We find ourselves perhaps saying something that David once wrote in one of his psalms, In desperation, he calls out to God and simply says, Well, will the grave praise you? What's the point of dealing with me in this way? There are times in reality that you and I as Christians find extremely hard to accept as coming from a gracious Heavenly Father's hand. The beginning of the story of Ruth clearly indicates this. It begins with three deaths. The death of Naomi's husband Elimelech and then the death of her two sons Marlon and Kilion. How can you ever say something like that comes from a gracious heavenly father's hand? But that's the challenge that presents itself to our faith in days of difficulty. The doctrine of the providence of God, as well as being unspeakable comfort, is profoundly mysterious at times. The American theologian Don Carson once wrote, the mystery of providence defies our attempt to tame it by reason. I do not mean it is illogical, I mean that we do not know enough about it to be able to unpack it. It is a wonderful truth, but it is ultimately mysterious. Jeremiah Day, another American theologian of a previous generation, wrote, The longer I live, the more faith I have in providence but the less faith in my interpretation of providence. There is an awful lot in that statement. 
What that man was saying is that the longer I go on as a Christian, the more I am convinced of God's providence, that he's in control. But the more I realise how often futile are my attempts to work out perfectly what God is doing in any moment of time. Now I've tried to underline this truth in your mind by connecting it to those very important well-known words in Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God always works for the good in the life of his people. The doctrine of providence is ultimately what that is about. God is always working in our lives. But Romans 8 shows us that it is always for our good. But the question that we've been considering as well is, what is the good that God works for? And this is so incredibly important. And Romans 8.29 answers it. It is to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. You see, it is never our own personal comfort or success or happiness that is the foremost concern in God's purposes and moves of providence. As important to him as these things are, it is never ultimately your own happiness that is his greatest concern. Instead, it is the conformity of your life to the likeness of his Son, Jesus Christ. That's your Heavenly Father's great preoccupation in the twists and turns of life that he, by his providence, leads you foot through. It is that all the time you might be becoming more and more like Christ. Now that of course challenges, doesn't it? Many false views of the Christian life. The false view that ultimately all God wants for you as a Christian is to be happy. Or as some in some extreme cases today may tell you that God's greatest concern for your life is for you to be healthy. And so, no, it isn't. God's greatest concern for you is that you might each day be being less like your old self and more like Jesus Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi some very initially curious sounding words. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. And what Paul was reminding the church at Corinth about there was that through difficult times, and he's speaking there of great reality, I know what it is to be in need, he wrote. I know the reality of being hungry or living in want. At the same time, he says, I also know what it is to have been in plenty, to be fed, and to live in a time when things are good. But the reality is, in both of those situations, I have learnt contentment. Contentment is in measure, in degree, ultimately likeness to Christ. Do you ever read of Jesus being discontent in the Gospels? No. But wonderfully Paul speaks about the fact that he needed to learn this. And providence, by its twists and turns in his life, was teaching him these lessons. 
and how wonderful that is and how necessary it is in my life and in yours so the story of Ruth as we've been reading it is teaching us that as God works and he is working all the time his great agenda is Christ-likeness amongst his people but also as the story of Ruth has been teaching us it sometimes takes a bit of time to see exactly what God is doing John Flavel was a Puritan writer he wrote an amazing treatise once on the doctrine of providence called the mystery of providence but he also wrote at one time these simple but profound words of very great practical implication about providence sometimes providence like Hebrews, Hebrew letters the letters of the Hebrew alphabet and Hebrew words must be read backwards okay you don't read Hebrew left to right like you read English you read Hebrew right to left you read it in a different way and he says providence is like that sometimes indeed it must always ultimately be read backwards so when we read the book of Ruth backwards we see that a story it's a story that moves from chaos and pain to ultimately order and joy what opens with three funerals and dreadful isolation ends with a wedding and the joy of the birth of a child tears of sorrow genuine tears become real tears of joy and we've also been seeing in the book of Ruth that ultimately this book as indeed all of scripture we find that the one great dominant theme is of course Jesus Christ he is everything as we have seen already ultimately in God's plan and purpose it's not just our own personal happiness but it is God's purposes in Christ Christ likeness that matters and in the story of Ruth and as we look closely we have been seeing that what is most important here is not just that in the end everything works out okay for Naomi Ruth and Boaz because ultimately in the end that is not everything what is everything the book shows us is God's eternal plan of salvation through Jesus Christ so when we read in chapter 4 that as a result of their marriage Ruth's conception she gives birth to a little boy and they name him Obed there's a lovely picture in verse 16 of chapter 4 of Naomi taking little Obed laying, in, laying him in her lap and caring for him that the birth of this child as we've been seeing is not ultimately a blessing simply to Ruth and Boaz but it is a blessing to the whole of humanity because by that child the line of David is maintained the line through which one day Jesus the Savior of men and women boys and girls will be born into the world now this point is so important and this is the ultimate issue in the book of Ruth the issue here really is the need for the maintenance of the line through which the Messiah will come this is so important that even when we read of Ruth's pregnancy in chapter 4 verse 13 it is very clearly in the words of the text attributed ultimately to God so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife then he went to her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth it is so important this is ultimately what it's about that that little phrase the Lord enabled her to conceive underlines the whole message of the book God's grace God's working central you see to all of God's providence is his love for sinners in the gospel 
His love for Ruth and Boaz, his love for Naomi and even little Obed is very clear in this story. But his greatest love is for sinners in the gospel. It is the gospel that drives the story of Ruth forward. It is the gospel ultimately that took her to glean in Boaz's field. It is the gospel that caused it to be that she went there just at the time when Boaz arrived. It is the gospel that brings them together. It is because of the gospel that Obed is born. The gospel drives everything in the book of Ruth. I think the person who put this most clearly is, is, is Spurgeon. He speaks about providence and its relationship to Christ in this wonderful way that only Spurgeon could ever say. The keys of providence swing at the girdle of Christ. In other words, the great thing that unlocks the doors of life, the twists and turns, what is it ultimately? It is Christ and his glory. And that's why I've been reminding you here this morning that in all the experiences of life, in all the changing shades of life, whatever it may be, sorrow, joy, perplexion, frustration, delight, whatever the experience may be, it is all ultimately for the glory of Christ in your life. Christ likeness. And here is, as I was explaining to you last time we looked at this, the principle of the big story and the little story. In the book of Ruth, the little story is about a family who are devastated and then head back to the, where they used to live in Bethlehem and eventually out of the ashes of broken lives comes something very beautiful. That's the little story. But the big story is all about the coming of the Messiah. And these are not two distinct stories, are they, in this book? They do not happen independent of one another. Instead, God in his perfect wisdom and mystery meshes them together. And you know what this morning? This is true of your life and my life. The story of my life and the story of your life, like the story of Ruth. And Naomi and Boaz is a little story. It is. The things that happen to you, they're very personal to you, aren't they? Your upbringing, the parents you had, the home you came from, the family maybe which you went on to have or not have, your work, your health, your sanity, your experiences, your ups, your downs, your highs, your lows, all of it's there. That's your little story. But the amazing thing is, your little story is perfectly meshed into the will and purposes of God's big story. And that's why, again, his great concern in the twists and turns of your life is the glory of his Son, Jesus Christ in you. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? Your life that's so ordinary. You roll out of bed tomorrow morning. You say, who am I? <laughs> well, maybe you don't say that, but if you did, who am I? You say, I'm a nobody. You ever try Googling your name and finding that there's no reference out there to you at all? And you think, nobody knows about me. They don't even know I'm here. I'm just a nobody. An ordinary little person. A brick in the wall. A tiny little cog in the vast machinery of the universe. But the reality is, God knows all about you. And the little story of your life as an apparent nobody is a vital part of his big story and his purposes in the world. Now what I want to do this morning, very simply and briefly, is do something that I've not actually seen anybody do before, although I'm absolutely convinced it must have been done loads of times, it's just I'm so thick I haven't been able to come across it. I want to look at this narrative, which we're now so familiar with, through Boaz's eyes. 
really the book encourages us to look, doesn't it, through Ruth's eyes and Naomi's eyes. But what happens if we look at it through Boaz's eyes? You see, often when it comes to the telling of this story, and often in sermons which I've preached in the past and I've heard others preach, Boaz effectively is reduced to simply being the provider. He's rather like the groom at an over-organized wedding, whose great job really is to do two things, turn up on the day and say, I do. Everything else is in the hands, perhaps, of the mother-in-law or something like that. Terrific energy, terrific fuss, loads and loads of planning, hours and hours of planning, great detail. But when it comes to the groom, mate, you just make sure you're there and you say, I do. And we can look at Boaz like this. We can find ourselves saying, well, he's just an important part of the story. But really, the main characters are Ruth and perhaps Naomi. Well, Ruth is the main character, and I wouldn't want to argue that Boaz is the main character, but Boaz is too. And he has a life too. I suggest to you that when we look at the story through Boaz's eyes, some very interesting things start to fall into place. We know a bit about Boaz from the narrative, don't we, the text. Um... Chapter 2, verse 1 tells us he's a man of standing. And we saw last time that quite often the words in the Hebrew used there are words that speak, are used to speak of wealth. So he's done well. We also know from chapter 3, verse 10, that he's getting on a bit. When in the middle of the night he says to Ruth, you have not run after younger men, whether rich or poor. On a bit. He's, he's a man who's wealthy. And we also know from the text that his wealth has come as a result, perhaps, of years and years of He's a businessman. He's a farmer. He has fields. He has men working for him. And within all of this, crucially, of course, seen in chapter 2, man, when he sees Ruth... Uh, he speaks to the field where the men are harvesting, follow along, along after the girls. And not to touch you, just help yourself drink that the men, from the water jars the men have filled. He is kind and generous. So Boaz is getting on a bit. He's a businessman who's done well through honest, hard labor. He's kind and generous. And the text also tells us in chapter 2 that he's a close relative of Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. Verse 20 of chapter 2 tells us that he's, and this is a technical phrase, he's a kinsman redeemer. Now we don't have kinsman redeemers in our culture, but they did in Israel. Those of years ago, provided, there was provision in the law of God that when relatives were in danger or perhaps great need, a kinsman redeemer had the opportunity in law to act on their behalf, particularly in matters of property. We'll perhaps hear a little bit more about that on another occasion. But crucially, and here's the really crucial thing about Elimelech—sorry, about Boaz, so you're getting the, the identikit picture now, aren't we? You know, getting on a bit, wealthy guy, kind, generous. He's in this position of being a kinsman redeemer. He's got some powers in law that connect him to Naomi and her family. But crucially, unlike Naomi's husband Elimelech, Boaz is a man of faith. How do we know that? Well, it seems to be the very clear implication from the, narrative, from the story. Elimelech chose to leave the land of promise to go and live with the Moabites. We saw that in chapter 1, do you remember? Because there was a famine in the land. And there wasn't a famine in Moab. And everyone might think, well, that's just sensible. Except the problem is, by walking out of Israel and into the land of Moab, you're walking out of the promised land into a land of pagans. You're also walking into a land not only of pagans, but upon which God's judgment was resting. 
Because Deuteronomy 23 in the law we're told that God had once said that because the Moabites had failed to help Israel in their day of need, his judgment was on them. So much so that a Moabite and their descendants may not enter the assembly of the Lord even unto the tenth generation. So Elimelech sinned. He said, I'd rather take chances with the enemies of God than stick with God's people in God's land facing the consequence of why there is a famine in the land Boaz on the other hand didn't do that he stuck it out why? I think the reality is he chose to stay with God's people despite the difficulty because he was a man of principle and faith Similarly, we also know clearly from the text in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, that he is impressed by Ruth's life for two reasons. Firstly, her kindness, but secondly, for her faith. I have been told about all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother, your homeland, and came to live with a people you did not know. May the Lord May you be rewarded richly by the Lord, the God of Israel, and you have come to take refuge. So when Boaz looks at Ruth, he is impressed not only by the fact that she's kind, but she's a woman of faith. Which again suggests that we are also looking at here in Boaz, a man of faith. But Boaz has a problem, doesn't he? And this is where we really look at the story through his eyes. He's a great man, a man of faith, kind, generous, wealthy, but getting on in years. And we cannot overlook the obvious difficulty he was facing in his own life. He's lonely. Okay? We don't know why and we shouldn't speculate why he's a single man. What we do know is that God in his providence kept him single until this point in time. Now I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that Boaz wasn't very happy about this. After all, why in the end does he marry Ruth? If he's absolutely, totally content to be single, why marry Ruth? No, I don't think he was particularly content at being single. He wants to get married. He doesn't want to be on his own. And as a result of this, I think it's fair to say he's lonely. Now there is such a thing as singleness as given by the Lord to an individual as a particular gift from the Lord for a very that is to be lived in a particular way for the glory of Christ. And that is a, that is a blessing in itself. That is a rare thing, perhaps. And it wasn't Boaz's experience. You can imagine the gossips in Bethlehem, can't you? Oh, poor old Boaz. I just don't get it. He's got everything going for him. He's probably on paper the most eligible bachelor in Bethlehem. But there's no wife. Why is that? And you can imagine his own thoughts as well. Why hasn't the Lord led me to the right person? What's wrong with me? And perhaps as the years tick by, it becomes even more challenging to Boaz on the relationship front. And maybe he's even given up ever finding Mrs. Wright. We mustn't underestimate the tension who has everything on one hand and yet he's lonely yearning for a partner and then one day as the story shows us Ruth walks into his field and he's kind to her and he blesses her and you know when you read in chapter 2 verses 14 and 16 you know of all the kind things Boaz does for her I tend to think myself, this was just both being both. What's that? He respects Ruth. 
because what she's done for Naomi, he respects the fact putting faith on Israel. And those are the things that kind of drive him along to be kind to her. He's just being kind. But somewhere along the way, things start to change. And Boaz begins to take a romantic interest in Ruth. <coughs> now, as it ever is in these situations, women can see the implications sometimes far earlier than men, can't they? So, for example, Naomi can see the implications. In verse 22, she responds to the news that Moab seems to be hinting, as Ruth seems to be hinting, that it's a good idea to stick with uh, going to Boaz's field. And she kind of almost cuts her the, uh, off the conversation as she dives in with both feet. It would be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls, because in someone else's field you might get harmed. You kind of get the feeling when Naomi says that, that she's beginning to wonder if there's a little bit more to this than just basic kindness. Stick with this man. And so Ruth does. And of course you know what happens in chapter 3. One night Boaz work, wakes up after a bit of a party with the boys after they've been uh, working hard on the threshing floor to find the room smelling of the equivalent of Chanel number no. 5 and Ruth in a posh frock lying at his feet. And he's rather panicked by it, isn't he? Who's there? What's going on? But in the conversation, finally, the penny drops for Boaz. And as soon as the sun is up, he's off in the morning to assert his rights as kinsman redeemer. And the next time we'll look at what happens there, and it's a very wonderful story. So in Boaz's situation, this man who has everything and who is lonely, one day after many years perhaps of self-doubt, uncertainty and a fair degree of loneliness, God blesses him with a wife. Now I want to conclude here this morning by saying that I think this presents to us, when we look at the whole of the book of Ruth, through Ruth's eyes and Boaz's eyes, we see a challenge to our own living. You see, both through Ruth and Boaz, we see God's providence. The hinge in the story is chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. I guess you've understood that by now. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem. Two apparently chance events, which we know, of course, were not chance at all, but were events ordered before the foundation of the earth for the work of the gospel and the coming into the world ultimately of the Messiah, that you might be Christ-like. You see... It was chaos, rebellion, death, distress, fear and loneliness that became the road that led Ruth to Boaz's field. It was very dramatic, wasn't it? Three deaths, living in a foreign country, famine, the shame of return. That's all really dramatic stuff. It was that road that led Ruth to Boaz's field. But have you ever found yourself asking what took Boaz to Boaz's field? I'll tell you what it was. Another dull day at the office. Just another day. Just another ordinary day. You see, the reality is, it is in all things that God works for the good of his purposes in his people. In all things. It's not just in the things that come to us wrapped in shiny, glittery paper. It's also in those things that perhaps are just in an ordinary, dull, brown envelope. Whatever it is, however, 
everything is part of God's providence in our lives. And I think because of this we should be very excited about every day of life. Even the dull, boring days. You sat here this morning thinking perhaps your mind has wandered during the service. Don't worry about it, but it did. It happened, you know. And you, you were thinking about tomorrow and you thought, oh. And what lessons you've got at school. Or uh, what you've got to do. You've got to go to the dentist. You've got to fix the car. You've got to go to the post office. You know, you've got to pay this bill or something like that. You know, it's just the ordinary stuff. But I think the reality is, for the Christian, there is never ultimately anything such as a dull, ordinary stuff. In all things, God works. In all things. So in the ordinary working of this man Boaz, whose life just appears so ordinary, and yet he's faithful, one day God did an extraordinary thing. You know that day when he just happened to arrive in his field the same time that Ruth got there? He didn't roll out of bed that day with a whole bunch of angels at the foot of the bed cheering and jumping up and down. There wasn't great fanfares of trumpets. There wasn't a red carpet rolled all the way from his house to his field. He didn't walk along the street perhaps that day with a particular spring in his step. It was just another day. And yet what a day it was. What a day it was. I mean, man, what would have happened if Boaz had decided to go on a Mediterranean cruise or a holiday for that week and missed Ruth? Well, it's unthinkable, isn't it? He just stuck to the ordinary stuff. And God worked extraordinarily. I said earlier in the service about your little story. Do you know, sometimes one of the problems we have as Christians is that we think that our lives are so ordinary they can be of no consequence in the great affairs of this world. Friends, I want to tell you this morning that nothing could be further from the truth. God sometimes does extraordinary things through ordinary people living ordinary lives in a very ordinary way. You see, ultimately, it's not your life that counts, but what God is doing with it. And what an amazing thing that is. And what a comfort you can have. That no matter how ordinary you appear, no matter how small you are, that in all things he is working. Yes, he's working in your life. No matter how mundane, no matter how... No matter and the very last thing I want to leave you with here this morning is a particular challenge. Which path would you prefer when you look at the narrative, the story in Ruth? The path, the dramatic path of loss and pain and sorrow that Ruth took? Or the rather mundane, ordinary path of faithful stability in the life of Boaz? I think the truth be known, we'd go for Boaz's path, wouldn't we? Because we don't like the pain and the trauma. The challenge God calls us to live uprightly before him and not in rebellion. He calls us to do, in other words, to be men and women of faith, not faithlessness like Elimelech that took him to Moab and all the rest of it. You see, when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are not asking God to do his will. We are acknowledging he will do his will. And no matter what we may do, his will will be done. And so the challenge is this, to live obediently and to live humbly. Because if we choose to run 
and walk away from him. Ultimately still, his will will be done. And along the way, whether it's the path of Ruth or the path of Boaz, wonderful things happen for his glory. We're going to sing to close this service him about the providence of God. God is the refuge of his strength, his saints, when storms of sharp distress invade. Stand to sing.